357 Hemp Logistics provides fully insured transportation and supply chain management solutions for the hemp industry. From seed to store, hemp is never just another commodity to us. With best-in-class technology and a customer portal, it allows you to have 24-7 real-time visibility with our track and trace technology. Secure your hemp logistics partner for both domestic and international shipping by visiting our website at www.357company.com or call us at 844-357-SHIP. Good afternoon. Uh, Going to be a little different one today. Uh, even though you see, may see Dave Crable's face on there, Dave is actually out doing a family little chore out on the West Coast. So um, uh, we appreciate Dave's help with getting us set up today to do this, but uh, Dave won't be here today. So um, the IHAMP Hour, uh, we want to thank uh, our new uh, sponsor. You'll see their their logo up here in the uh, right-hand corner of my screen anyways, uh, 357 Hemp Logistics. Uh, their experience allows you your peace of mind. They're fully insured to ship hemp der derived products from seed to store. The 357 company leadership team collectively has over 50 years of transportation and supply chain management logistic experience, as well as developed operational processes and procedures for the highly regulated medical cannabis and the restaurant delivery industries. They provide fully insured logistics and supply chain management solution customized to maximize the value of hemp farmers, cultivators, processors, wholesale markets, seed banks, manufacturers, retailers, and distributors. The carefully vetted partners have access to their superior carrier network, comp compliant SOPs, and special handling solutions for both general commodity freight and hemp derived products, including biomass and seeds. The 357 Hemp Logistics is a leader in customized logistics and supply chain solution tailored specifically for the hemp industry. Hemp is not just another commodity to them. You can contact Kevin Schultz at 708-612-2422. That's Kevin at 357company.com or www.357company.com. So again, thank you very much, Kevin, for your support of the show. We appreciate that very much. And we'll be certainly talking more about their services on later shows. So, uh, Mike, you got some news to share with us today, huh? I do. I have another show on Wednesdays called 420 Post, which is primarily focused on the cannabis world. But we do bring in some hemp guests. And we brought in Greg Polowski, who is a, a, a economic planner at the city of Detroit. And yesterday, and I haven't had a chance to uh, post that video. I'll be doing that yet this afternoon to... Uh, 420 post on Facebook. But anyway, what he said was the city of Detroit is very interested in getting involved in the hemp industry. Uh, they have well, actually 75,000 parcels right now that they own, of which 39,000 are vacant land. And what they like to do in part is use hemp for remediation efforts so they can clean up all the gunk in the ground. But he also said he, they were very interested in farming upwards of 1,000 acres in the city so that they could get not into the hemp edible area like CBDs and things like that, but more and well, all the other 20,000 products that could be made from hemp. Um, and uh, the, the Mayor Duggan is very interested in, in getting behind this. Uh, and hopefully he said over the next few months, we'll get some more details on how, what they want to do. Um, clearly though, if they're, I mean, these, these parcels are zoned residential right now, so they got to change the zoning if they're gonna be doing farming in the city, but they're already doing farming in the city. A lot of these empty plots are being used right now by various gardening types or even organized companies that are actually growing agricultural products in the city of Detroit. But and we also mentioned that uh, the auto industry is starting to get on board with hemp. And as we talked about in previous shows, where uh, I think it's Porsche and BMW and a few others are using components instead of polycarbonate sort of components, they're using hemp now in, in lieu of that for interior and exterior parts. So uh, we were hoping that maybe one of the auto industry, GM or Ford, even Fiat for that matter, uh, would be interested in um, perhaps uh, getting behind this, but we're a little premature right now. It's just hopeful thinking, but uh, an interesting opportunity for the hemp industry in Detroit. And again, we'll have that video up on Facebook here right after the show ends. I'll be editing that next. All right. Well, thanks, Mike. That's really great news. That'd be interesting to see uh, hemp being grown in all those little plots on there. And they can harvest that seed for grain and for feed. And yeah, 
So that'll be interesting to see. We know how good it is for remediating the soil, so that'll be interesting to see where that goes. So. Yeah, they, they, they got a lot of vacant land in Detroit. I don't know when the last time you were in Detroit. Yeah. So there's a lot of opportunity there, but there's a, a few hurdles that have to be overcome. So. Great. Well, thanks for that bit of, th bit of information, Mike. So I got just a little bit of news. Um, the big stuff all this week uh, on the hemp uh, websites and emails that have been coming out have been, of course, about how the elections now will affect us and change for hemp farming. And so we'll see what all comes out of this whole process with that. But so far, nobody's really um, uh, really had anything really bad to say necessarily on it, but we just have to keep vigilant. I do have a little bit here. I'll take it from U.S. Hemp Roundtable in a minute. But the first thing I want to talk about is there's a contest that's coming out. Uh, the National Hemp Association will be sponsoring their first hemp harvest photo contest. They want to see your best harvest photos and read about your 2020 season. Uh, application will be taken until November 30th. Submissions are through Google Forms. Participants must have a Gmail account to upload files, or you may email your photos and description directly to, uh, and I'll, we'll put this on the website here and in the chat, um, nhahempharvestcontest at gmail.com. Three winners will be selected for the best like photo. Photos and participants will be showcased on their homepage for 30 days and they'll receive a National Hemp Association t-shirt, one year membership to your organization, if you're already a member, they'll, they'll give you another year. And uh, National Hemp Harvest 2000, uh, Hemp Harvest, uh, National Hemp Harvest 2020 Hemp Harvest uh, membership, I believe, comes with that as well. So we'll put that up there. Uh, if you got a lot of good pictures, uh, we'll talk more about uh, some other ways you can enter your photos uh, at the end of the show regarding the expo. We've got a lot of great updates that we'll give at the end of the show on that. Uh, we're ready. It's up and live, and we're already taking... Um, exhibitors and also attendees can now um, register. We have a special uh, reduced price that goes on to the end of the month. And, and, and there's no live anymore on this is all virtual, right? Right. Due to the uh, recent uh, restrictions that came down um, from the um, Health and Human Services Department, it reduced our numbers down. Uh, there just wasn't practical to try to have a live show anymore at the uh, at the Radisson. So uh, we may still have a small live segment of something, but that'll be the, the Hemp Awards party. Um, that may still happen, but um, again, we'll see how things move forward. Obviously, we all know in the state here that COVID is ramping back up pretty uh, pretty fierce. Um, in my particular counter I'm at, it's the highest positive testing rate. So uh, so we're being extra vigilant here, making sure we're a mask and doing that. But we're looking forward to a great, um, great and a fun, uh, fun-filled and fact-filled expo for sure. So... Um, so there's been some movement on the hemp CBD from the Senate Appropriations. The U.S. Senate Agriculture Appropriations Committee released report language for the appropriation bill that we negotiated with the U.S. House. And we'll get the links up to the full copy. Again, I'm getting this off of the U.S. Hemp Roundtable. If you just went there, all this information is there. Now, this is just the Senate's version. The House will have to weigh in when they do it. But there's a number of key provisions that are important for the hemp farmers. Um, on page five, the Senate directs USDA to modify the controversial interim final rules to provide a more fair and reasonable regulatory framework for US hemp farmers. You will note that the Senate calls out many of the key issues that we have shared with Congress and USDA, including inappropriate DEA uh, interference, testing and sampling issues, and the arbitrary 0.5% THC negligence standards. It is clear that your lobbying efforts have effective have been effective and are very optimistic that it will make a difference as USDA works on their final rule. So you can read a lot more about it there and they also have the bill you can click down there. But again, this is for the bill HRH179. If you haven't already, please contact your, uh, your representatives to make sure that they're in support of that and you want them to support that bill as it moves through both the House and the Senate when they come out with their version. So. With that, um, we're going to move right into our guest, uh, Dave uh, Gear from um, Canna Systems. He's going to show us, uh, we're going to talk about decortication, and we're going to talk about uh, where this market's going to go with this, uh, with the byproduct of all the plants. And Dave, maybe you can give a little background of yourself and how you got involved in all this. Well, um, my name's Dave Greer. I'm the sales manager for Canna Systems Canada. Um, I'm actually a musician was my first career um, uh, and I uh, 
I've always believed in sustainable building. And uh, because musicians mostly don't make any money, I learned uh, <laughs> other trades in, uh, and became a, a salesman in the entertainment industry. And uh, started making enough money that I could think about building a house. And I wanted to build it out of hempcrete. And uh, I couldn't. You can't buy the hemp herd in, uh, in quantities at a price point and locally sourced and if it's not locally sourced it's not sustainable building so uh that was really how i got involved i'm, I'm going to stop it there because uh, that's actually a little later in my presentation um but suffice to say that uh, i worked in the entertainment industry until last march and when covid hit um there is no more entertainment industry certainly not for live events and uh and I, I was forced to rethink what I was going to do with the rest of my life. And I thought, if, if I have to be a salesman instead of a musician, I would like to sell something I'm passionate about. And uh, anyway, uh, like I said, more on that a little while later. Uh, Canna Systems Canada is uh, a five-year-old company, actually incorporated a little more than two years ago. Um, we built the R2 decortication machine, hemp stock processor. Um, the company has bootstrapped its way to its current state where we have gone through the design, we've built a full scale model, we've done the testing, we've sold one unit, um, but we're still technically a startup. But what we believe um, <clears throat> is that if we can find um, 10 visionaries, uh, that's actually my first purpose at Canna Systems. Uh, it's and by extension, my same purpose here. Um, we're looking for 10 people who want to be involved in the industrial hemp industry. Uh, they could be farmers now. They could be people looking to start a standalone processing business. There's a few different ways that could work. But I wanna, I'm gonna stop here and I'm gonna read you a definition uh, that I found for visionary, which is the ability to get a clear picture of the future is the reason the concept is also used in the business field to denote a leader who is able to anticipate future opportunities. And uh, I think that's important um, because yes, I'm a salesman. Yes, I would love to uh, sell a ton of decorticators. I'm not even looking. If somebody put in an order for 100 machines now, I would tell them no. Um, and the reason for that um, is that the what we're looking at now is the final phase of our development process looking for 10 visionaries we call this the alliance membership that's the first 10 purchasers um, of the first 10 machines it's limited to 10 it's limited to north america um, and we're offering a hundred thousand dollar plus discount um, from the uh, msrp on the machine as a sort of a uh, you know we want it to be a two-way street where we're asking people to trust us. We know that we've built the machine. We know that we've tested the machine. We know that it works. Have we tried it with every cultivar? Have we tried it with every planting density? Have we tried it with every climate and soil type in North America? No. So that R&D um, is what we call the Alliance membership um, to give a huge discount to the first 10 purchasers of the machine to have a collaborative approach um, to the uh, yeah to making it work, uh, we'll be having people travel um, to the locations where the machines are to work with these alliance members to uh, make sure that the machine is doing what it's supposed to do, and how can we optimize it for the uh, specific task at hand, the cultivar, cultivar, and the uh, planting density, and so forth. Um, the, Really, we're looking for people to have a feedback loop. Tell us what's happening with the machine. We make an improvement to the machine, then all other nine machines are retrofitted with the same improvement. So this is a collaborative development process between ourselves and 10 visionaries. Um, Can I ask you what the machines go for? Uh, just, you said $100,000 off, off of what? Uh, the MSRP is uh, 300, <clears throat> excuse me, 330,000 USD. So 225,000 is the price as it okay. is. Um, it's, uh, 
you know, is a, a, a fraction of the cost of most of the competition. Uh, most of the competition are, you know, million dollar plus permanent installations. Uh, we have a huge advantage, not only in price point, um, but also in the fact that our machine is not a stationary machine. It is uh, built inside of a 40 foot shipping container. Hmm. It will go on a flatbed truck. It will travel from farm to farm. Um, it could be set up as a, an installation where farmers brought the bales to a location, but it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, if a farmer had enough acreage to make it a viable uh, process, uh, we think that's about 250 acres, but obviously there's a ton of variables. Somewhere around 250 acres, um, it could sit on one farm and, uh, and, and, and be quite profitable even there. Um, so more of a like a, if a trade association would buy it and then share it among their members, something along those lines, perhaps? Yes, it could be a coalition. It could be a sole farmer. It could be an entrepreneur that wants to start a processing business. It could be a coalition of smaller farms. There are many ways that this could work. Uh, I'm negotiating uh, actually for one spot, which I hope is already sold. So really, I'm only looking for nine people, but I can't say that. There's not a signed contract. Yeah, until um, the paperwork's completed, right? <laughs> yeah. Pardon me? I said until the paperwork's signed. It's hard. That's, that's right. But he is, in fact, uh, someone who is working with a coalition of farmers. So absolutely that could work. Hmm. Um, the, uh, you know, it, it, this is, is our, our way of, A, finishing our development process. But it goes back to our original mission five years ago. Um, and here's where I go into the origin story where I've already done my own half of it. Uh, let me uh, just open this up because I actually have it written down. Um, I just have to remember where. Yeah, about our technology. It's the same problem I have when I'm... <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what instrument do you play, by the way? Uh, principally guitar, but I play bass. I play stand-up bass. I play keyboards. I sing. I uh, have a recording studio in my basement used to be in a, a commercial space and I tried to make a living at that but it's now a hobby studio in my basement uh, yes I miss the I miss the concerts that's for sure I certainly do we're going to try to have we're going to maybe have a mini concert for the expo this year we're going to try to do that so we'll see if that works if they ever get zoomed to work well enough that people, people could actually jam together from different locations I know they sort of say that you can but not really but if they ever get that happening then uh, we may see the birth of yet another uh, type of live performance. Um, okay, so a little bit of background. Uh, approximately five years ago, Bruce Ryan, the co-founder of the Canadian Hemp Trade Alliance in 2003, was asked to fill an order for 40 tons a week of hemp fiber. With all his connections developed over 25 years in the industry, he was unable to fill the order. And with this came the realization that while Canadian hemp seed crops had established a solid footing, it, the lack of decortication facilities in North America were the missing link to the growth of other potential industrial segments of the hemp industry. Decortication being the separation of the outer bass fibers from the inner woody core of the plant, which I'm sure at least most of us already know. Um, partnering with Ron Larson as CFO, a financial executive with 30 plus years of experience with Price Waterhouse, Manulife, XPRIZE, and Na NASA launch crew team, Canna Systems was born. Um, with the addition of Dave Greer as sales manager, the team is ready to grow into a revenue generating operation. Um, I'm skipping the next because I already said it earlier, but uh, you know, I'm going to, a little bit of an aside, um, I know that everybody has their own motivations for wanting to be involved in the hemp industry, but if anyone hasn't thought about it, um, you know, one, one uh, quote that I heard recently said that if we grew 85 million hectares of hemp, that that would be enough to start a reduction in the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere year after year. Now, while 85 million hectares sounds like a lot, on a global scale, it's about the size of the state of Texas. So hemp, you know, is, I'm preaching to the choir here, but you know, a six month growing cycle versus 25 years for trees, nine times less water to grow than cotton. Um, 
five times the ability to uh, sequester carbon over timber. Um, it really is a pretty incredible thing. And again, I got into this because I'm passionate about it, um, not just because, well, I mean, pandemic had something to do with it. It ended my last job. But uh, realistically, um, we believe that the hemp industry is going to grow in leaps and bounds in the coming year, months, years, decades. Um, how fast it grows depends on the likes of people uh, like Canna Systems, and like the visionaries that we're looking for, and other people. Obviously, you know, it is a global thing. Hopefully, the smaller markets will, will build um, th through the, the development of the infrastructure. It's, uh, you know, you can grow hemp, but if you have nowhere to process it, that's as far as it goes. And if you can process hemp, well, great. But unless you have a market for the processed goods, that's as far as it goes. And... The large manufacturers, as we heard talking about making inroads into the automotive industry and things like that, um, would be quick to adopt it, or much quicker to adopt it rather, if they knew that they could get the product. But again, because the processing isn't there, it's not being grown. So we have to find a way to develop the markets in tandem with each other. This is another thing that the Alliance membership uh, is entitled to, and I can uh, I can say that in the last several weeks, I have put three different potential customers um, in touch with potential markets that they didn't have. Um, in the case where I meet someone who is either connected to farmers or is a farmer, and they say, I have all this stuff, I've got you know, tons and tons in my barn. Um, I sold the seed, I have all this stock, what do I do with it? Well. I'm calling up people like, uh, um, I'll drop a couple of names, uh, Just Biofiber um, in Alberta. Um, and uh, uh, they, they make a, a hempcrete block. Um, it is unlike most hempcrete, which is not structural, it's usually an infill system. They make a block similar to Lego with posts and holes that all fits together. Um, and it's structural. You can build up to five stories high with it. And they can't get enough herd. So when I'm talking to potential customers of our machine and they say, well, I have a use for the fiber, but I don't have a market for the herd. Well, I, I put them in touch with just biofiber. Um, there's a lot of that going around. In fact, as was already said, the company started on a request to fill an order with, um, for fiber and it, it couldn't be filled. Um, the, there is a few, uh, actually, you know what? Why don't we, uh, well, I had one more thing I wanted to do before the video, so just give me one quick second. All right. Well, you're doing that, let me ask a question. Are there any prohibitions about, say, if you grow hemp in the, in the States, shipping it to Canada or vice versa? Are there any issues with that? Um, I guess the short answer on that is I don't know. Um, the, uh, obviously it would, I think you guys have a, a, an issue down there that because all of the states have different regulations as what constitutes industrial hemp in terms of THC content, there, there may be issues there. Uh, in, in Canada, it has to be less than 3%. Um, and uh, the, fiber, the, the fiber should be fine to go across, um, you know, and it's all usually grown from plants that are less than 3%. So that shouldn't be an issue too much, I'm sure. I'm sure like everything, every government job, there's a bunch of paperwork to get something across the border, but yeah. But uh, yeah. The reason, because you were saying about how well one might do this and one might do that, maybe they could, between Michigan and Ontario, we could have this arrangement, to, you know, to what you guys do well, what we do well, you know, the best practices kind of thing. Well, absolutely. I would love to speak about that with anyone interested. As I said, I don't know the law inside and out. I would prefer to somebody else, but obviously, like any problem, it can be solved. Um, and I would love the opportunity to speak to anyone who wanted to uh, um, collaborate with us. Okay, so show the video, or uh, I have one more blurb I want to read. Okay. The video. Um, Along with cannabis, hemp is the fastest growing agricultural crop in the US and Canada, uh, with 
hemp acreage doubling to approximately 200 acres in 2018. That's only half the story. Profitable though hemp is, farmers are barely skimming the surface for their crop's profit potential and they're farming for hemp seeds. Now, that's a Canadian viewpoint. I know CBD is the big one in the US, but regardless, uh, to be turned into oil and food products. Uh, throwing away 98% of the stocks and plowing them back into the soil. Only 2% of North American hemp crop goes into the biofiber industry and turned into construction materials, clothing, and all of a million other things. Uh, hemp farms are actually giving up about $1,000 per acre um, of potential income by not utilizing the whole plant. And uh, I'll go over the numbers to say where I got that $1,000 an acre because it uh, it does have to be understood. Um, <clears throat> if you're growing for CBD, you probably don't get four tons of crop per acre. And I know that. And that $1,000 is based on four tons per acre. But if you're going to grow for fiber, um, if you want multiple revenue streams, you need to grow a dual purpose cultivar. Um, and my experience is largely with uh, um, seed uh, seed crops and dual purpose crops that are for, for the grain and for the fiber. So you're talking about a relatively dense planting. Um, you're talking about uh, uh, six foot high plants, not one meter high. Um, we have one farmer here in Ontario grew 15 foot plants this year. Um, uh, so it can definitely be done. Obviously there's more infrastructure required. You're going to have to harvest those two streams separately. Um, one way to do it would, would be with a dual head cutter that uh, conveyed the tops into a, a wagon and uh, left the stalks cut down in the field where they could go into windrows and bailed and so forth. Um, so when I say $1,000 per acre, it's not like at our machine and suddenly that happens. Um, but with careful planning, like any business, you make a business plan, you grow the right crop for the right reason, um, you have the right machinery to do it. Uh, a hemp farmer could realize revenue from the herd, revenue from the fiber, and revenue from the grain and or tops. So it's just a matter of making a plan to do it. And with only 2% of the total amount of stuff grown actually getting into that industry, it shows we really are in the infancy of, of being able to do this on an industrial scale. Um, it actually plays into the size of our machine. Um, uh, it is a lower price point. It's a smaller machine. It's one 40 foot container. Um, it does, um, based on our testing, uh, it's quite happy at two tons an hour. We believe it could do up to four tons an hour, but that would take, you know, automated feed processes and exactly the right, um, uh, means of planting and harvesting to, to achieve that number. But we've seen two, two tons now. Um, and that seems to be about right. Um, when you look at to, to our machine to be a profitable machine that would pay for itself in two years or less, and the assumptions made for that are that you have um, four tons per acre of raw product, um, and that you have at least 250 acres um, of, of hemp grown. That's really, if you can, if you can say you have that, or if if you don't believe you can get four tons an acre, then maybe you need 500 acres. I mean, it, it works any way you like. Um, but it realistically could turn the. Uh, um, uh, where have I got that? I'm assuming 220 electrical on that, right? Uh, 480, 50 for 60 Okay. Yeah. Um, at Canadian electrical prices, it's about $25 an hour to run on electricity. Now I should point out that, uh, the, uh, electrical transformer is an option on, on our machine. Um, it's designed to be mobile and therefore comes, uh, with a diesel gen set. Um, you don't need an electrical hookup. Um, but if you wanted to have it as a permanent installation, we can ship it with the transformer in lieu of the diesel gen set um, at the same price. Why don't we, uh, Dave, why don't we go ahead and show in the machine? See what it says. So I have to do what, Dave, uh, Jeff, share what? 
from my the the so when you pick what you're gonna share, which is your desktop uh -huh. or whatever program, uh, down at the bottom it it should have some type of select your audio, and you want computer audio, and then hit the share. Well, it's not, but. Well, if we can just see this, I guess let's just maybe Dave well, can you see it at all. Well, okay. yeah, it's it's only two minutes long. A lot of it without the audio doesn't mean much, but here we have stocks in the barn. This is, you know, a real farm in Canada where it's just sitting there. And this is this is what differentiates us from anyone else: um, the helical heads rather than the hammer mill technology. It's far more gentle on the herd. Um, it creates longer fibers, um, easily uh, two and a half to six inches long, which I believe is the spec that BMW wanted for their panels. Um, and, uh, and you don't get it from a hammer mill. Now, this is through the testing process. That's the heads, um, decortication heads in isolation. That's not the whole machine, obviously. And uh, that was dry stock that was going through there. All of the parts are CNC'd. So every machine will be, uh, you know, built to the best quality. Uh, digital control systems, those, uh, the straw walkers we just saw uh, allow the herd to fall down. Um, and the fiber goes up the straw walkers. Um, that's the bale ripper at the beginning of the machine, opening the bales and feeding. I would like the old washing machine ringer almost, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> it is. I had the displeasure of meeting a ringer washer when I was about seven years old. It lifted me ah. right up to my shoulder. And so uh, some of this makes more sense with the audio. But, uh, but I'll, I'll, get better. <laughs> I'll get better. And this is the best way to contact you, these Alliance at Canna Systems, or maybe Dave, if you have a better way, if you want well, to type in the chat. Alliance at Canna Systems, uh, I will, will come to me and it will also come to the CEO. Um, you can, uh, if you want a personal email, uh, DG Hempcrete, um, DG is my initials, Dave Greer, Hempcrete at gmail.com. Perhaps we can put the video up on the iHemp site, uh, Dwayne, and uh, yeah, our Blaine, we'll get, Dwayne. We'll, we'll get Blaine, that blah. <laughs> yeah, we will. And I didn't get that three fingers of Jack, like I said earlier. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I I think we are realistically the only, um, certainly the only machine that I have seen out there that is truly truly self-contained and mobile. Um, you know, uh, uh, transportation infrastructure exists all over the place for moving shipping containers. And with self-contained, everything's there, your lighting, your dust collection, your diesel gen set, the whole nine yards. Um, it really is a plug and play machine. Hmm. However, the Alliance membership will allow us to fine tune it and come up with and, you know, see where its weak points are, fix them retroactively on all 10 machines, um, and push them hard, see where they feel, fail, see where they shine. Um, and the idea is to make a huge benefit for all. It's worth pointing out that anyone who was actually um, wishing to be an Alliance member, in addition to the um, uh, discount on the first machine, um, once we've finished the development stage and we're in mass production, you would be entitled to the same discount um, if you wanted to um, have another machine or sell to a farmer in the next county, uh, in effect, you become potentially a dealership, making $100,000 with each sale. Huh. Last year in North America, over 300 million in hemp stock was wasted due to an inability to process the material into its two components, fiber and core herd. We know this because we have talked to over 300 North American farmers all looking for a solution. There are 1,500 existing hemp farms in Canada and over 21,000 hemp permits were issued in the U.S. this year. We have designed, developed, and built the R2 Hemp Stock Processing System, a self-contained, portable, modular, 
high performance farm machine to address this problem. Looks pretty small too. Uh, the in 2019, well, rigorous testing there, began on the R2's helical head design. Machine. The results? Um, spectacular. Outside of the container by itself. The addition of straw walkers on the back end of the helical heads allow for the separation into two streams, the fiber and the herd. Digital control controls the entire system. Bale rippers added to the front end of the machine mean that the R2 is capable of processing up to two tons of raw stock per hour. Mounting all of this machinery in one 40-foot container means that the R2 can travel from farm to farm. for getting that to work right there. Yeah. So, what's, so what's the best, um, I saw it on, on the tables there, kind of all spread out, but can you handle it in round bales, square bales, balls? Yes, round or square, it will do both. And in fact, I think it was a square bale you saw the guy pushing in at when it wasn't in the container. Uh, and it was a round bale that was being unrolled um, in the one of the latter shots in the video. But it is capable of dealing with either. Um, huh. And what's the lead time, Dave, to be able to 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 build the machine and that kind of stuff? How long do how long time do you need in advance for this? Uh, about eight weeks. Eight weeks? Yeah. Eight weeks. Hmm. All right. Well, good. Well, if we got any other questions for everybody, go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, we'll do that. Dave, any last things you want to wrap up with us? Well, let me just look at my notes because I didn't really follow them. Let's just see if I missed anything. All right. Um, I think you've got a really interesting product there. Uh, and, you know, I'm not the hemp farmer in this group, but I'm the technology guy in the group. And um, it seems like that's really been the, the, one of the big obstacles that, and you're solving that problem. And, and the fact that it's a portable unit, I think, wow, you know, for associations and co-ops, things like that could be really the solution. It really could be. It can be, uh, um, it, even as a standalone business, I mean, we went through uh, uh, sort of revenue revenue forecasts. If someone were to buy a machine um, who was not a farmer, who was connected and or had contracts with various farms adding up to a, a sufficient acreage. Um, the, uh, and let, actually, I do have that. I can get to that really quickly. Give me one second. So yes, if you were going to pay a farmer $200 per ton of raw stock, and these numbers are, are Canadian, uh, the price numbers I gave you were American, but uh, the numbers I'm giving you now are Canadian, um, $200 for raw stock, um, and then you have... Uh, 200 a ton. It's $200 a ton then, right, Dave? That's correct, yes. Mm -hmm. um, and you were processing even a thousand tons per annum. Um, so your cost per stock is going to be two hundred thousand dollars. Your cost for manpower to run the machine um, and uh, other expenses one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars. So total cost three hundred and twenty-five thousand. Uh, if you were to then sell the um, um, you were then to sell the uh, the herd at two hundred and fifty dollars a stock and the fiber at a thousand dollars a stock. Um, that same thousand tons would yield four hundred and seventy five thousand dollars. That's a net profit of one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, which is why I said uh, the machine pays for itself in less than two years. Hmm. Um, and uh, you know, obviously, 
depending on what your market is, if you're marketing to textiles, you're going to need some uh, other processing. It'll have to be opened and cleaned and possibly combed. Um, but there are markets for the, uh, the raw product right out of our machine as well. So it's really up to each person's individual um, situation. Okay, we've had one question from Clyde. Uh, has, has anyone from Michigan expressed an interest in the machine? Um, I believe that my first contact in Michigan, um, now it is through you guys, was uh, Clyde Kaler, was uh, mm -hmm. uh, the gentleman who introduced me to you guys. Mm -hmm. um, as He's I the said, one that asked the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Clyde, so Clyde has shown some interest. I, I, have, uh, I have potential. I and I have talked about it too, about uh, different uh, co-ops and things like that happening and and uh, yeah, so. Yeah, now, as I alluded to earlier, um, I was working in the entertainment industry right up until March 18th. I was laid off basically one week into the pandemic, at least, you know, on March the 10th, I had six months of events booked. And by March 18th, I was laid off and they all canceled. Um, mm -hmm. So anyway, I started negotiating with, uh, with Canna Systems in I think July um, and September. Uh, I came on board. I spent the first five or six weeks studying and learning because, you know, this is not my uh, uh, area of expertise. It was only my area of passion and what I wanted to build in my house. Um, so I, I, we really are at the genesis of this. I've been actively uh, reaching out to people for about a, a month to a month and a half. I have potential customers, two in BC, um, uh, one in New England, um, another one in Maine, uh, which I guess is still New, New England, isn't it? Um, Technically, yeah, they would call that. Mm -hmm. But uh, <clears throat> but yeah, I have about five really good prospects. One that I'm I would bet money on is actually going to go through. Um, and uh, uh, my goal is to get these first ten machines sold. By March the 31st. That way, everybody's ready for um, the new planting season with a with a business plan. Pardon me for the 2021 year. Yes, exactly. Right yeah. You know, this might be something Gary Schiller would be interested in too, Blaine, because Gary wants to start a hemp textile industry in Michigan. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of things that are going on right now um, in a lot of different places with trying to bring the industry here in Michigan. And this is just one of the aspects of it for sure. So, um, yeah. So Dave, well, thank you very much for your time today and sharing where we're interested to, uh, to keep, to watch the story as this unfolds for, for Canada systems and for the industry. I mean, this is something we need to get this industry going. We've got to be able to process this so that the, so that the manufacturers can get the raw products they need to have. So, yeah. That's and it'll be interesting to hear how things progress on your uh, house building. Yeah. Yeah, so that'll be good to hear that. Thank you for talking about this creep, this hempcrete thing. And we'll, we'll want to follow up on that because uh, that sounds really interesting too. And that's one of the things that we're going for, of course, is a sustainable future with the hemp industry. So that's right. That's right. Absolutely. Well, I thank you for the opportunity to be here. And uh, I look forward to uh, any uh, questions by uh, email if uh, anybody out there wants to uh, reach out and speak with me directly. Why don't you uh, just uh, just for the sake? I know we ask people to put their contact information in the chat area, but why don't you for the viewing audience? Why don't you give that information one more time? Okay, so um, our website is www.canasystems.com. Sorry, .ca. <laughs> there is another .com. Please do .ca. Um, and uh, the uh, email um, alliance at canasystems.ca and my personal email dg that's david greer hempcrete at gmail.com great thanks okay. we'll make sure we get that information uh, tagged to the to the uh, show today too so yeah there's a ton of information on our, on our website if anybody um, is even remotely curious about anything um, that was that's the first place to look you can also uh, subscribe to our newsletter there. Um, and if you do subscribe to our news newsletter, I'll be notified and I will reach out uh, to you personally. 
Um, and uh, yeah, uh, I'm really, really excited. I think that 2021 is going to be the year that this starts to explode. I think so too. I think we're going to have a lot of things that are going to come into place this next year, uh, certainly for sure. So, all right. Well, any other questions, put them in the chat. We'll make sure we get them, try to answer by the end of the show. And again, we want to thank uh, uh, 357 Hemp Logistics for their sponsoring of the show for the next few weeks. Uh, we certainly appreciate that. Make sure you can contact Kevin Schultz at 708-612-2422 or Kevin at 375company.com or www.375company.com for the web address. So get to the uh, Expo website uh, real quickly here, and then I'll do my uh, my recipe for today. And... Yeah, you're going to want to stick around for that, Dave. The highlight of the show is the hemperer. So uh... now, <laughs> everybody seeing the a, a sustainable world? Yep. Okay. So this is the website, uh, MidwestIHempExpo.com. We are, are up and live. We have a couple of glitches we got to take care of. But um, so we're up here now. Uh, we, if you want to be an exhibitor, the information's here. You can click on that. Uh, and uh, if you want to get the Expo Pass, it's there. We have special pricing right now until November 30th. So there's a reduced rate for early bird. And there's also a reduced rate if you're an iHemp member. We're going to make this opportunity available to other groups as well. Um, Midwest Hemp Coalition, U.S. Hemp Growers, uh, HIA members, we're working with all that. So there will be discounts as well for them. But uh, the early bird pricing right now is, is the early bird pricing that everybody will get, even with a membership later on. So, so we're really excited that we finally got this up and going. Um, we're going to cover a lot of things on food, fiber, and health. This is We're bringing a lot of industry in here. Uh, it's a two-day event. It's January. Uh, the 22nd and 23rd, that's a Friday and Saturday um, is when it will be. And um, down here we have the sponsorship opportunities. People can look at that if you want to sponsor something. Uh, the Hempy Award sponsorship, that's going to be a fun one to do for sure. If you have other questions, you can call us on there. I want to spend just a little bit of time on the Midwest Hemp um, Hempy Awards we're going to do this year. This is something new, something fun that we're going to do. Um, basically, the idea here is that we have categories you could enter your hemp products in. Um, so the categories we have are food products, photos, personal care products, pets, innovations, textiles, and miscellaneous. So the miscellaneous category is open to anybody to enter from outside of the Midwest as well, and they can win that. The other categories are meant for um, Midwest uh, comp people. In Midwest, we're considering is uh, Indiana, uh, Ohio, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Um, and it's a $50 per entry fee. And what about, what about our, our friend Dave? You're in Ontario, right? Uh, yeah, so, so if Dave had something he wanted to enter, innovations, let's say he wanted to put in for the, for the decortication machine, he would put it in under the innovations is where he could put it in under, or he can also put that in under miscellaneous and a, and a chance to win the award. We're going to have three places, uh, first, second, and third in each category. The photo category, you can enter in uh, both amateur and uh, professional can enter. And we're going to have one award given away for this for the people's choice. So during the expo, people will be able to vote on the photos to have a people's choice in, in that category. The other categories, um, you have to have your submission in by uh, Saturday, December 12th, and we're going to judge them on the 19th, and then the judging information will be done, uh, tabulated by um, Robert F. Murray Company, and then they will, will award, just like the Oscars or any of the other stuff, we'll have an envelope that night. We will not know the winners until that night in those categories. So we're hoping to have a fun little Zoom party called a mass grade party. Um, for on, on Saturday afternoon, Saturday evening, early evening, uh, to give away to announce the winners and give away the awards. So, um, will you one. be wearing a tux, Blaine, or not? What's that? Uh, will, will you be wearing a tuxedo? Uh, I plan on grabbing a tux that night. Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think I'll be the presenter, but maybe one or two. I might maybe might do that on. But so we're looking for a fun evening, and this is the evening where we're going to try to have a an actual kind of band come and play a little bit. So we'll have some live music going on. And so just looking for a lot of fun. This uh, expo is going to be a lot of fun for everybody. A ton, a ton of information is going to be there. Um, 
uh, the exhibitors was there, the speakers, we've got some lined up for the speakers on here, but we do have to get the rest of the uh, itinerary up for that, uh, how we're going to run that. But um, exhibitors will be able to have their own uh, rooms and be able to share their information. So again, just a ton of great information is going to be available for this. So we're excited, very excited to get this off and running finally. We really wish we could do the live. That was our plan, but unfortunately, other things got in the way on that this year. So any other questions anybody got for the good before we get into the fun part of the show? <laughs> All right. Okay. So today we're going to share something. I think this would be a great little dish for uh, the upcoming holidays, uh, especially for around uh, Thanksgiving time. Uh, asparagus with crunchy hemp nuts. Ooh. Need one to two pounds of fresh asparagus. You need a tablespoon of extra virgin olive oil. You know, we always replace that with the hemp seed oil, obviously. One tablespoon spring of filtered water, uh, one tablespoon bals balsamic vinegar, sea salt, quarter cup shredded hemp seeds, excuse me, shelled hemp seeds, a uh, pinch of curry powder, and one to two sprigs of fresh parsley minced. And this is an interesting thing. I didn't know this about asparagus, but you snap off the tough end of this, this asparagus stem, snapping them rather than cutting them ensures that the asparagus will not take on a bitter flavor. Really? So there's your, there's your uh, tip for the day. Hmm. And the rest of it, we'll have it on there. It doesn't take too long to do. It's about two minutes to uh, obviously to uh, when, when you get the, when you cook the asparagus, so it's kind of soft and you put it in this mixture and you go for about two minutes and, and it puts it on a nice little plate to present and it'll be a good healthy dish for everybody to enjoy for the Thanksgiving season. Now, next week, we're going to have a real chef on. <laughs> Uh, Lance Lampier is going to be on. He's going to actually do a little cooking show, kind of like a Rachel Ray thing, I think he's going to try to do. So we're looking forward to that and, uh, and having a good time with him next week. So with that, anybody else have any other questions? And if not, we want to thank you again, uh, Dave, for joining us today and sharing the information on that decortication machine. And we'll see where all this heads with us in the future. And everybody have a great and safe week this week. See you later. See you next week, everybody. Thank you.